Stephen and Diane Freeling are raising their children, Dana, Robbie, and youngest daughter, Carol Ann, in Cuesta Verde, a California housing development. All is well until a strange event involving Carol Ann and her television set herald the beginning of a series of bizarre supernatural incidents, culminating with Carol Ann being abducted through an otherworldly portal. The parents eventually seek help in the form of parapsychologists and eventually spiritual medium Tangina, who will aid the family in battling the ghosts plaguing them in order to save their daughter. The movie is, of course, Toby Hooper's 1982 horror classic, Poltergeist, which was chosen for discussion today by our guest, Scott Shermer. Mr. Shermer is a filmmaker based out of Bloomington, Indiana, and has written and directed Found, based on the Todd Rigney novel of the same name, concerning a young boy who discovers his older brother may be a serial killer, and Harvest Lake, which concerns a group of friends who fall prey to an otherworldly presence at the titular location. Both movies come recommended by this fan. Mr. Shermer, thanks so much for being our guest. Um, As with every episode, I have to start the conversation out by asking of all the horror films to consider for discussion why this one why poltergeist well to be fair my absolute most favorite horror film is the texas chainsaw massacre but i have never been able to really adequately put into words why i love that movie so much so i didn't want to tackle that one because i i'm basically like uh uh oh gosh chris farley from saturday night live remember that skit where he'd have famous people on his tv show and all he could say was remember that really thing that really cool thing you did that was cool that's how dumb I am when we talk about Texas Chainsaw. <laughs> so I knew I couldn't go for that one. And then after that, it was either Gremlins or Poltergeist. And I've decided that I've, I, I think Poltergeist needs a little more love in the world today than, than Gremlins does. Um, but Poltergeist, my God, I've seen it. I mean, there are probably eight movies I have seen hundreds of times literally you think i'm kidding you think i just love it and i've seen it maybe 12 times but no i promise you i've seen poltergeist at least more than 100 times (laughs) and i watch it at least once a year it is one of the most utterly watchable and enjoyable films ever as far as i'm concerned i will i will look for it whenever it's playing anywhere it recently screened here in indiana at the iu cinema And it was a nice 35 millimeter print. And it was a glorious experience to see it in a THX certified theater. Oh, gosh, Um, no doubt. Oh, yeah. It sounded incredible, too. The the film was a little, you know, tore up in places. But, you know, it's decades old and we'll forgive that. Poltergeist is just it's just a, a spectacular showmanship. I mean, with Steven Spielberg's name on the bill, you know, you're going to have some degree of that. Um, But it's a little bit less sentimental, I think, than some other Spielberg films. And I think that Toby Hooper brings it a little bit more edge than a lot of other Steven Spielberg films have. So it just kind of hit a sweet spot for me in a dark, hard-edged piece of well-crafted showmanship that is not without heart and is not without humor, but... and. Uh, but gosh, but as a filmmaker, when I watch it, I just marvel over all of it. So hopefully that helps explain a little bit why Poltergeist. But then I might also say, why not Poltergeist? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Now, I have to ask, you said it was great to see it on the big screen, and I would agree. I've uh, I've seen it twice on a big screen myself. I never filmed, sadly. It was uh, digital projection each time. And yet, you know, both times were kind of amazing. And it feels like such a big screen movie. Like, you know, that's yeah. something that just cries out for being, uh, you know, seen in an auditorium with other people. But... Uh, uh, just a shot in the dark here. You mentioned it was between Poltergeist and Gremlins. I'm guessing you're like me in that you were probably a child of the 80s. Am, am yeah. I right about that? Yeah, I was 6 to 16 during the 80s, and those are really formative years. So everything that came out in the 80s, I was very hyper aware of because I decided I loved film in 1980. In fact, the first time I was ever aware of time was 1980. I'm serious. I think I was in 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 uh, elementary school. I was in kindergarten, and the teacher wrote the year, the date, on the chalkboard. And after it, it said 1980. And I remember going, "What the hell is this 1980 shit?" So I could t- tell you that I was never aware that I was in the 70s, but it's not at all for drugs or anything like that. I just didn't know until I was six years old that there was this thing as such as time, and. Um, 
I decided after the Empire Strikes Back that I loved movies and I was just a big giant movie fan from age six on. And Poltergeist is probably the first time I remember the first time I saw it was not in the theater. Uh, I didn't even know it existed until I think my parents rented it on video cassette VHS and brought it home and I was watching it and I did see E.T. and I had seen Raiders of the Lost Ark. And I loved Star Wars, and I kind of thought George Lucas and Steven Spielberg were the same person because every time I liked a movie, one of their names was on it. So I just figured (laughs) they're the only ones making good ones. And I remember when they put in Poltergeist, I was surprised to see that Steven Spielberg name on it. And so I decided, oh, this is one I should pay attention to. This is one that I might like. And I was right. (laughs) I did. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Being a child of the 80s, I was wondering what your first experience with the movie was, either, you know, seeing it in a theater or, uh, you know, catching it on VHS for the first time. And I'm sad to say the first time I saw it, you know, I saw a lot of classics during that era on the big screen. But uh, Poltergeist was something that I actually uh, I discovered on uh, videotape years after it had come out, sadly. I remember when the they finally started putting movies out letterboxed on video cassette and around the time laser discs were big. That was when I decided, oh my gosh, I have to go find all my old favorite films that I saw growing up and rediscover them in the proper aspect ratio. Um, I think it was 92 that the Star Wars trilogy came out letterboxed for the first time. And when I saw those letterboxed on tv for the first time it was a fucking can i cuss <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Swear <laughs> it away. was it was a fucking revelation to see those in two <laughs> three five to one again because i'd only ever seen them in four by three you're missing almost half the damned image and when i found out that poltergeist had the same aspect ratio that the star wars films had i was like oh my god i've only seen half the movie and when i finally saw i had to buy that i think it was a hundred bucks i paid it probably 80 to 100 bucks to get the laser disc of poltergeist wow and it it was like this four-sided thing and a lot of it was cav which is the highest quality um i was just i was in church just watching it in that aspect ratio again and the blu-ray that the warner brothers has put out is absolutely gorgeous it's got a lot of nice grain and you can even see it kind of blurring and smuts and fudging out on the edges because of the anamorphic lenses and i just love looking at it in that aspect ratio warts and all it's a beautiful film for that ratio yeah it's it's absolutely gorgeous i uh, i gotta say you uh you mentioned laser discs as a collector i uh i sadly sort of missed the boat on laser discs i went directly from vhs to dvd in the day but i do remember that weird sort of transitionary period in the uh the mid to late 90s when uh you know that was an option uh with mm-hmm. vhs you could buy full screen or you could buy uh widescreen and i you know kids have it so great today I, I sound like an old man saying that but i mean can you imagine like a young cinephile coming up today even needing to see a full frame version of something anymore you know I'm just glad we don't have to worry about that crap anymore, except when I go to half price books, then I have to turn everything over and look to see if it's a full frame version. But thank God we've all switched and and we're watching movies the right way now. Including absolutely Poltergeist, which you're right. I mean, it is a gorgeous movie. And I, I can't even remember what it looked like, Pan and Scan, but I got to imagine it was kind of a travesty because, uh, you know, Toby Hooper certainly, I think he shot it with an eye toward it being a a widescreen movie. You know, there are certain directors I think who uh, really take advantage of that. Carpenter, I think is oh, yeah. probably the king of it, but you know, watching Poltergeist, Hooper certainly had a command, I think of that image. Well, you're saying Hooper, but people are saying it was Spielberg. Yeah. I, you know, I was going <laughs> to jump into that. I was as a fan of the movie, I was going to ask you what your uh, stance is on the whole uh, Hooper Spielberg controversy. The notion that, uh, you know, Spielberg wrote and produced the film and Hooper directed it. He's listed as a director. Spielberg has acknowledged him as the director of the film. And yet there are all these persistent rumors that Spielberg had mm, much more of a guiding hand than a producer typically would when it comes mm-hmm. to how the film was crafted. So I got to ask, uh, what's your opinion on that as a fan of the movie and as a filmmaker too, uh, do you see more Hooper in the film? Do you see Spielberg? Do you think it's a melding of the two? It's definitely a melding of the two to what extent is very much up in the air. Um, I, before I say anything more about that though, I just want to re- remind people that Warner brothers announced probably 10 years ago, a special edition DVD release of Poltergeist that was going to have a a making of on it. And a few days later, all of the websites that are 
um, news sites for new DVD Blu-ray releases, they had to put out a correction saying that Warner Brothers had decided they were not going to make it a special edition. It would not have a making of. And I could only imagine Steven Spielberg making frantic phone calls behind the scenes <laughs> to quash that, you know? I love Spielberg, and I'm, I'm not... I don't want to like paint him in a negative light, but this was the very first film he ever made. He actually wrote the story. He's not the only screenwriter, but it was his story. And um, he storyboarded the entire thing. He's on record saying that he storyboarded the entire thing. And um, he has admitted publicly that he probably overstepped his bounds and um toby hooper i also think knew what kind of a project he was getting himself into um this was his first giant big hollywood production and he's on record saying he learned a tremendous amount on poltergeist just about working on a film of that scale and with steven spielberg and we also have to take into account the fact that they've worked together since then. Um, I can't remember every time they've worked together, but I remember when we watched the TV miniseries Taken, yes. Toby Hooper was one of the directors on that episode. And I believe he's worked with Spielberg a few times since, or that's Spielberg a, has hired him again anyway. It's a damn good miniseries that people don't bring up often enough. It was pretty good. And... Um, so I think it's somewhere in between. And then you have to listen to the cast and crew, and it's it's all over the place. James Karen says it wasn't it was just like any other film set he'd ever been on. Producers that are creatively involved in the movie are not a new idea to him. Um, Joe Beth Williams speculates that it might have been annoying for Toby Hooper at times for such a controlling producer to be there and uh, overstepping his bounds into the territory of what the director is supposed to be doing sometimes. And then Tangina, the Zelda Rubenstein is the one who really, I think has fueled the fire of, you know, oh, yes. trying to throw Toby Hooper under the bus. <laughs> she did not like the man at all. I believe she even insinuated that drugs were involved at some point. And she's, she insists, that she was only ever directed by Steven Spielberg. And um, then there's also David Geiler, who uh, is one of the producers on the Alien franchise. He visited the set one day and came back and told some people, now he knows what an executive producer does. They tell the actors what to do, they tell the camera person what to do, and then they stand back and have the director yell action. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. I so it's that, all over that. the set. It's all over the place. That is curious. You know, it, it, it is interesting. One of the things that I'd read was one of the actors noting, I don't think it was Zelda Rubenstein. And I did read that she, uh, her remark that, uh, there were some unwanted chemical agents involved in, uh, you know, keeping Hooper from directing all the time or something like that, which is, uh, you know, kind of an astonishingly mean spirited thing to air publicly, but you know, whatever she's Tangina, she's cool. But, um, you know, one of the things that I'd read would be that Hooper essentially set the frame and, you know, they would do a take and then Spielberg would actually be the one to make the adjustments with the actors. And so if he did the storyboards and he was giving adjustments to the actors, then I'm wondering what Hooper was doing there in a way. And I say this as a fan of Toby Hooper. I Texas Chainsaw is one of the greatest you know, it's in my own personal top five. That's an amazing yeah. movie. And he's made, you know, uh, many, many, he kind of made the a citizen Kane of horror movies or whatever, in the sense that, you know, if he's Orson Welles here, then, uh, you know, it's kind of like he made his greatest movie right out of the gate. And then yeah. as a result, it overshadows the rest of his filmography. But, you know, looking at his filmography, he still has many strong features to his credit. So when I see something like Poltergeist that works so well, I can't say that, he isn't capable of making that movie. Right. And but, sometimes the lighting in Poltergeist really reminds me of um, Eaten Alive and Texas Chainsaw. Oh, absolutely. So, so I, I, I think there's definitely some Hooper in there. And most of the cast and crew, from what I gather, say that it was a collaboration of sorts. I think we all have to give um, Hooper and Spielberg the benefit of the doubt and that, that they were both collaboratively involved in spearheading that thing. Spielberg, uh, I read somewhere was not there three days. So for at least three days of the production, <laughs> Hooper had full control of the set. Um, but also you have to consider that Hooper was not involved in post-production after delivering the director's cut. Um, Spielberg and James, or is it James Kahn? Michael Kahn uh, edited, re-edited the film together and only Steven Spielberg worked with Jerry Goldsmith the composer so you really you can't deny the the influence of spielberg all over the movie it's got his fingerprints all over it i think um the director's guild 
uh, well, actually, is Universal. Universal had a clause in that uh, since Spielberg was pr- in pre-production on E.T., at the same time Poltergeist was in production, he was not allowed to be directing another film. So I think he picked Toby Hooper to direct Poltergeist only because he had to. And um, that it was a thankless job, and I can't imagine that that Toby Hooper took the job knowing that it wasn't going to be at least a little bit thankless. But I think Toby Hooper probably viewed it as a great learning experience, and it was. And from what I've heard from Hooper, he doesn't have any regrets about the thing at all. Um, I think he's pretty proud of it. The only bad thing that happened um, to that note was when they put out the first trailer for Poltergeist, Steven Spielberg's name was bigger than Toby Hooper's, oh, wow. and Hooper and the Directors Guild sued, and um, they were award- and Hooper was awarded, I think, fifteen thousand dollars in damages for uh, for them dispar- the studio disparaging the director's contribution to the movie. Um, wow! But I other than that, that it happened. I'm, I try to look up all the Poltergeist news I can because it's – for a filmmaker, you can find news on any movie out there. There are all kinds of commentaries, behind the scenes, articles written. Poltergeist has always been sh- like shadowed. No one wants to really talk about it. Um, it's all secretive. And um, so I'm waiting for the day. Hopefully I'm still alive when all the principal players are dead <laughs> and people aren't afraid to like really do an expose so you can find out what really happened. And to some extent, I know that's none of my business. But at the same time, it's one of my favorite damn movies. And I love it so much. I just want to know everything about it. It's that kind of a thing. Yeah. And I feel that way, too, you know, where, you know, it isn't necessarily any of our business what went on behind the screens. But at the same time, you know, we're fans. We we sort of share in the ownership of movies after a while, I think. And I don't think it comes from any sort of mean spirit or gossipy place to want to know what happened on those sets. You know, what happened when action was called? Uh, I don't feel that way anyway. But um I like knowing how boring it was. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 that fascinates me. I love being a fly on the wall. There's a book uh, called A Diary of the Making. What is it called? Once Upon a Galaxy, A Diary of the Making of the Empire Strikes Back. And it was a paperback novel released at the time the film came out. And it's basically a day-by-day rundown of how fucking boring it was making that movie. <laughs> and I love it. Those are the best. I, you know, as an aspiring filmmaker myself, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I find that stuff fascinating. I'm, uh, I always tend to roll my eyes when you can tell that the EPKs that are put out for oh, yeah. movies these days are, you know, so overly produced and, you know, uh, everyone is happy and there was only happiness on the set and right. everything is great and it was marvelous and wonderful and everyone loves every, yeah, bullshit. You know, I want to see that, you know, my favorite film documentary. I don't even know if you would consider it a documentary, but it's one of the greatest things I've ever seen about the making of the movie. It was only on that 10 case special edition of, uh, have you ever seen the movie old boy? No, I haven't seen that yet. <gasps> I want to. You haven't yeah, seen the, the movie. Oh, my, it's a documentary. I, haven't, I haven't seen the movie yet. I think Ending I walked call. I know <laughs> I walked in on part of it. Cause my, my friend Jen had a copy and she was watching it and she always tried to get me to watch it, but it's one of those ones that's just been on my list for a while. It is one of the handful of movies that I can watch and feel energized about wanting to be a storyteller like that. And taxi driver and pulp fiction are like three movies that, you know, I pop them in, I watch them and I immediately want to make something. If, yeah, please. Dear God, sir. Watch, wow. watch taxi old boy. driver. I love taxi taxi driver but it's like schindler's list i can't watch either one of those movies without like just being in a really sad mood for a long time afterwards oh it's depressing as hell yeah, yeah. absolutely but uh i i don't know what it is it, uh, those movies for whatever reason they they charge my batteries but uh yeah if okay once you you definitely don't want to watch the documentary before you see the movie dear god don't do that but uh once you watch old boy try and track down that documentary it's three or three and a half hours long wow and it's basically just a fly on the wall point of view of the making of the movie day by day by day by day, seeing what happens on the set, just watching not people necessarily talking into the camera uh, about how great it was working there. You actually see people working and sweating and slaving to make something great. And you see arguments and you see strange interactions on this. It's so damn good. Um, And uh, anyone listening out there, if you have an interest in filmmaking, track that documentary down. It's pretty fantastic. Awesome. I'll do it. Sorry, digression, but, um, and life is full of digressions. It's okay. (laughs) (laughs) Fair enough. Now we've been talking about Spielberg quite a bit. It was interesting. Uh, I don't think I realized this straight away that, uh, 82, uh, was considered as having like the, the summer of Spielberg or the Spielberg summer where, uh, not only Poltergeist was released in June, but within the same week, ET was Uh released too. My 
God. I know. During the same year that gave us Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, Rocky III, The Dark Crystal, Conan the Barbarian, Tron, The Thing, my God, The Secret of Nim, First Blood, 1982 was just this incredible watershed year for genre cinema. And I just, I, I wish I was just more aware of it and a little older at the time so that I could have appreciated it more. But E.T. really eclipsed everything. I mean... That was the Gone with the Wind of 1982, um, and um, to some extent, most of these other films that I just mentioned, including Poltergeist, it did all right at the at the at the box office. But they really, and the Thing especially, the horror films from that year especially, got short shrifted. They all got discovered a little bit later on home video. But now, when you look back and look at how crowded that summer and fall were with amazing, spectacular genre films, you've got to say. 1982 was the year for sci-fi fantasy horror. I don't think we've had one like that since. Yeah, exactly. I was just thinking about that. And when is the last time we had a great summer like that? And we've certainly had great movies, but just one classic after another after another. I I, I can't recall. Mm-mm, not yeah. like that. Not Poltergeist one weekend and then E.T. the next weekend. And my God, it's just incredible. Yeah, yeah. And it, it is weird that Poltergeist does sort of get overshadowed by some of those other movies. I mean, it's still – weirdly, I mean, we, we talk about the movie being overshadowed, and yet at the same time, whenever you bring up the title, people do acknowledge that it is a classic. So yeah. is I is there such a thing as an underloved classic? I think – I mean, uh, this might – I don't think most people would agree with this, but I kind of feel it's true to some extent. I feel like Jaws used to have the reputation that Poltergeist still has. I think that, and of course, Jaws was a huge hit at the box office right away, so it's not quite the same kind of film. But I think people took it for granted after a while um, how amazing Jaws was as a film simply because it was so ubiquitous. It was on every TV channel. It was on cable all the time. Everyone had seen it many, many, many times. And it's one of those things when people talk about the greatest films ever made and they never bring up Jaws. And then you say, Oh, and Jaws or something like the wizard of Oz. They're like, Oh yeah, well that goes without saying. And I think Poltergeist is like that too, because everyone has seen it. Everyone does love it that I know of. If you don't love Poltergeist, my gosh, I don't even want to know you. (laughs) Um, And I think at some point it'll end up getting a little bit more respect than it has right now, but it's not that it's not respected right now. I think people have just seen it so much and it's such a part of our culture that it's just taken a little bit for granted. I wish people would watch it more with a filmmaker craftsmanship eye because I just don't think there are many other films that celebrate the craft of filmmaking as much as Poltergeist does. Because, especially in the area of effects, but not just effects, but let's talk about effects first. Industrial Light and Magic was at, at their heyday at that time. There's no CGI that I can that I've ever read about. They were dabbling in CGI in some places around that time, but I don't think there was any in Poltergeist. It was all photo optical stuff, and it holds up today. The only thing that doesn't really hold up is the tornado effect. The tornado looks a little dated, but almost everything else in that film is astounding looking and it's all inventive. Like the, the rotating room that Joe Beth Williams is like crawling around on when the ghosts possess her body or they're moving her around in the third act of the film. That is something that took an incredible amount of effort and time to capture on film. And they took that time and that effort or that creature, my favorite effect in the movie. And I bet I'm not alone is the creature guarding the children's bedroom door. When Joe Beth Williams is trying to get in there to rescue them. And that was a puppet in a giant tank full of water to get that anti-gravity effect of like its fur and its tendrils floating around, you know, that's, that's innovative. When I, when I saw in a book, the pictures of that puppet submerged in water being shot and backlit, I'm like, wow, that's magic. That's movie magic, much more magical. I would have to say than, than computers, um, not to be old sounding and done and denigrated CGI today, but the fact that they had to do it that way. And they went to the extent they had to go to get those effects back then. They're just more tangible and they're more hands on and they're just, I don't know, man, they're just astounding. The matte paintings are gorgeous. Um, that the, the devil head that comes out of the closet and screams at, at uh, Craig T. Nelson. I love that effect. 
and the house crumbling in on itself at the end of that movie looks amazing still that's not cgi that it's amazing that that's not cgi um but also just the photography back in the days when we were allowed to use all the colors instead of just orange and teal. <laughs> I love, I love, I love the way it looks. I miss a lot of colors in movies today. And oh my God, Jerry Goldsmith's score. I mean, I think Jerry Goldsmith is second only to John Williams and maybe Bernard Herman in the whole history of film scoring. And um, he received one of his many nominations from the Academy for poltergeist and he only lost to et so i I can't really get too (laughs) upset about that but the the score to poltergeist is one of the most exciting scores i listen to it all the time because the music all by itself really tells the entire story and um it's just phenomenal and the acting i don't think the actors get enough credit for poltergeist because this is the kind of film that doesn't have like really strong pronounced character arcs it's not a character study but there's there is this there's two different kinds of movies i think when it comes to characters there's the kind of movie you watch where it's not a character like you and you have an appreciation for learning about that character and experiencing that character's story and you know taxi driver would be one of those gosh so many kinds of films american beauty whatnot and then there's the other kind of film where the where the characters are really just mirrors that are supposed to show you in their shoes so that you experience the film like a ride and i think that that's more like any movie with kevin costner in it um and certainly i think with poltergeist and poltergeist is better, I think, than most of the films that are like that because parents, especially parent figures, moms and dads in sitcoms and movies from around the time Poltergeist are made, and even today, are usually portrayed as a little dopey, a little overly politically correct, and not very believable. But I think that Joe Beth Williams and Craig T. Nelson's characters, particularly in Poltergeist, are so real. Ever since I originally saw the film, I felt like these are my parents. These are my aunts and uncles. These are people that I know. They didn't even feel like they were acting. I think one of the many brilliant scenes in Poltergeist is that one where Joe Beth and Craig are in their bedroom and she's rolling joints while he's (laughs) reading some book about Ronald Reagan. And it ends with him standing in front of the mirror, sucking his gut in and saying that before, after, before, after joke. I don't know if that was scripted or improvised, but it feels improvised by two really, really good actors. And the whole film's like that with them. They don't, it's not on the page necessarily. Their characters aren't as strongly defined on the page, but damn it, those actors brought those characters to very, very believable life. You love them instantly. And because you love those characters, because they make them so immediately likable, you're in that movie with them and you care about the disappearance of their little girl because they care about that disappearance and you want to get her back because they want to get her back. And you're scared of everything in the movie, not necessarily because you yourself would be scared of them, but because they're scared. It's their reactions. Jesus Christ. Have you ever seen anybody scream um, and be terrified of things better than Joe Beth Williams and Poltergeist. I don't. I think she's right up there at the top, really, with most of the other scream queens. So I don't think the actors have ever gotten really their due. The children are, are passable for the most part. I don't think that they're. I don't think it's. It's not nearly what you see in ET. Some of the finest child performances ever put to film. But yeah. but they do their part. But the adults, I think, are amazing. I also want to give mention to Beatrice Strait because there was so much crap uh, about Beatrice Strait when she won the Best Supporting Actress Award for Network. And I just want to be on the record saying, I think she deserved the damn thing. I know that there was heavy competition that year, and it might have been nice if Piper Laurie had won for Carrie instead. But I don't mind seeing Beatrice Strait have that Oscar because for the five minutes she's in Network, I think she's fucking amazing. And she brings some of that likability and charisma to poltergeist i love when she's telling robbie in poltergeist about the light and how there are some ghosts that don't make it to heaven or hell they get caught in the middle and and they're sad and they're upset and and they take it out on the living because they don't know where else to go i think she tells that story beautifully 
So now that I've gone on about the cast long no, enough. No, I agree entirely. It is an amazing cast. And you're absolutely right in that, you know, it does hold it up. Those characters are mirrors for, if not, you know, when I saw it, it was, you know, I was a kid for the first time. So in a way I was, I was relating to the children, but in watching those parents, I mean, they do seem so very real. They were my parents, you know, they're, they're good people who aren't flawless, but, uh, you know, and it is so rare that we get that these days. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking about the remake uh, that just came out last year, but it's, I didn't want to see it. (laughs) It's not the worst movie you'll ever see. And I did appreciate one thing about it, which is that it's not one of those remakes that wipes away the continuity of the previous movie. I mean, uh, it it is another adaptation of that story, certainly, but uh, you know, the characters aren't named the Freelings. Uh, The daughter isn't Carol Ann, you know, but it has a good cast. Uh, you know, Sam Rockwell. I love Sam Rockwell. Is, yeah. Sam Rockwell, Rosemary DeWitt. Everyone in that cast is great. Uh, Jared Harris essentially plays the male version of Tangina, even though he's part Tangina and in a way, oddly kind of Quint from Jaws, which sounds awesome. <laughs> and he is kind of awesome. But, you know, I just wish he were in a better movie. It's not a bad movie. But when we're talking about characters, um, you know, I mean, I think of literally any other Sam Rockwell performance and I could rave about him, but not the Poltergeist remake for some reason. And, you know, I, I just never bought him as a real human being. And I don't know if that's down to him as a performer or if that's down to the writing, but you know, after his daughter is kidnapped in that movie, there's, you never buy that anyone is in peril. Like at most, he reminded me of Thomas Jane from Arrested Development. If you remember that, the whole, uh, I just want my kids back. You know, it's, it's so, it never lands in the way it probably should. Whereas in the original film, the entire cast, I think is fully believable. You know, they, they feel like real people. And as a result, you know, they keep the stakes high because we genuinely give a shit about them. They, yeah. It, it very much reminds me of like Twilight Zone, you know, the reason Twilight Zone works so well or the works of Stephen King, the notion of seeing ordinary characters in extraordinary situations. And the Freelings are absolutely ordinary. Yeah. And um, but not but not in a PC innocuous kind of way. I, no, and, and no, no. Talking about PC, I, I just want to say today, if they were going to remake Poltergeist as faithfully as they possibly could, they possibly could. I doubt they would reenact the scene where. Joe Beth Williams character Diane comes into the kitchen and sees the construction people outside making cat calls to her eldest daughter because in Poltergeist from 1982 Diane just kind of stands back and she's not really too concerned because she knows her daughter can take care of herself and her daughter does in fact make a, a funny gesture that ends up with her flipping off the uh, the construction crew. I feel like that's the kind of thing we would not be able to see in a, in a poltergeist made today. Yeah, I think people would that. feel compelled. No, the, Diane would be angry and, and insulted and go out there and, and do things. She wouldn't let her, her daughter, she wouldn't have faith in her daughter to take care of the problem. We wouldn't see that. I don't think we would see her rolling a joint. We wouldn't no. see her uh, have having experiments with her youngest daughter when the bizarre supernatural incidents in their house are not scary yet, but kind of fun. You know, I'm thinking about when they're in the kitchen. Uh, You're right. All of that would be cut. And I I can't really think of any moment in the remake that uh, adapted those scenes in any way. They even threaten Carol Ann with a spanking. Um, in that movie, they tell her to come into the light or she's going to get a spank. And Zelda Rubenstein's character encourages uh, Craig T. Nelson's character to, to use a firm voice and, and for him to be the one to yell at her because the little girl might be more afraid of her father than her mother. Those are the kinds of things that are not very PC to, to do. And I don't think that today you would see that. But at the same time, it's very real. And I think most people understand that and, and uh, they relate with it. Um so it's just something else that's precious about Poltergeist is that it involves a lot of social, I don't know, norms that are from a bygone era. Do you think it's <laughs> bygone in real life or only in the – Not st- really in real life, no. I do think that to some extent – I mean people don't whip their children or give them spankings as much anymore. I'm not 100 percent convinced that that's a good thing. Um, <laughs> but uh, we we have changed, but I think not quite as much as the movies would have you believe because they're just – they're inclined to be overly PC about everything, to not upset or offend anyone. How they get that PG rating with them smoking weed? I don't – because at some point they decided <laughs> that any weed at all makes the film rated R now. Which is ridiculous. 
ridiculous, but yeah, apparently they, I was reading that uh, on first pass with the MPAA, uh, poultry guys actually got an R. And of course, we didn't have such a thing as a PG-13 uh, then. That was a couple of years down the road. So I guess it was on appeal uh, yeah. when Hooper and Spielberg, Spielberg took it back that uh, that they got their PG, which is kind of crazy that, you know, looking at that movie today, look, I, I love poultry guys and I don't want to knock it. And I don't think this really is a knock. But I mean, when you watch poultry guys, it's not an R-rated film, but it's not a PG it's not a rated PG. <laughs> right it's a pg-13 and they just didn't have it at the time but it only took a few more films and a few more years before they had it and spielberg was one of the strongest proponents of having a pg-13 he he really thought that there needed to be something between those two ratings and now you know for sure he was right because every movie they make is pg-13 every superhero flick you know most comedy, every everything most horror films now too sadly <laughs> Yeah, that's 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 really sad, actually. It's like castrating sadly, but, a whole genre. Yeah, totally. I mean, I say sadly, and yet I love, you know, Poltergeist, which we would probably dub PG-13. And I love movies that trade more in suspense and suggestion than, uh, you know, uh, just gore uh, or uh, or violence. And yet I still love gory, violent movies. What I don't want to see are movies that should be gory and violent that are cut down to a PG-13. And it feels like that's what right. we get more often than not. I don't want to see a PG-13 slasher movie, you know? <laughs> no, no. You got to go there if you're going to have that kind of a film. Absolutely. Now, uh, okay, so you said you hadn't seen the remake yet. Is it just a matter of having not gotten around to it? Or are are you like me with certain remakes where you put your foot down and you're like, I don't know if I can do this. I love the original film too much. I never say never because if I go to some family member's house and have cable on and it's on, maybe I'll watch it. But I don't want to buy it and it's not on my list to see. <laughs> um, I just I didn't like the trailers. I didn't like what it looked like. So it's just kind of off my radar. Robocop's the same way. I'm not really opposed to all remakes, but they have to actually look interesting to me. Before I will I say see them. I am the uh, the rare fan in that. Like, I love the original RoboCop. I even love RoboCop yeah, too. Uh, RoboCop, yeah, RoboCop three. I I don't understand. You know, I, why I drew the line there. I never saw the third one. Really? Yeah, it, um, I only saw the first two, but I like them. I love RoboCop. I'd have RoboCop's babies all day long, just like I would Poltergeist. <laughs> Poltergeist and RoboCop are both in my top ten of all time. Oh, it's amazing. Both films, certainly. I, uh, okay, here's the thing about RoboCop 3. I recently revisited all of those movies when they hit Blu-ray in advance of the remake coming out, and I found that one is still a masterpiece, and I, I say that firmly. That film is firmly. a masterpiece. It is. RoboCop 2 takes everything that's fun about the first one and does it with a little less intelligence, and that's not a knock against the film. It's not a masterpiece, but it is a damn fun movie. Yeah, RoboCop 3 is ah uh, it's, it's <laughs> I don't easily, think I'll ever know. It, no, here's the thing. It's easily the worst. It is the worst. And I mean Peter Weller is no longer, you know, Alex Murphy which kind of sucks and they they do something to a beloved character in the first 20 minutes that is uh damn near unforgivable, but mm. So far as being like a fun offshoot of that franchise, like, here's the thing. I don't understand why that movie killed Fred Decker's career. The man gave us Night of the Creeps. He did the Monster Squad and then RoboCop 3. And RoboCop 3 is the reason we get no more Fred Decker. I mean, it wasn't that bad. He deserved maybe he deserved movie jail. He didn't deserve to get a movie execution. He walked the movie Green Mile and died because of that movie, oh. it feels like. I mean, he's writing what is it? It's a new Predator movie for Shane Black. So, I mean, at least there's that. But, God, that's what, 20 years on now? 25, something like that? So, yeah. how did I apologize for going off the rails about RoboCop. But my point was is that the remake for RoboCop was, um, to me, uh, God, I'm going to catch so much hell for this. <sighs> RoboCop, to me, was the best type of remake in that it takes something from the original movie and tells an entirely new story now that can either be thematic or it can be plot wise in robocop's case it's 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 plot wise it, it takes the idea of a cop who is destroyed and then he's rebuilt as a as a machine but the movie decides to tell a completely different story about that that has a completely different meaning from what verhoeven and company were doing with the original movie now i love that poltergeist is essentially trading it on the title it is yeah. a ghost movie that could have been called anything else. In fact, if you had called that movie anything but Poltergeist, you would watch the movie and probably say, hey, 
that's uh, that's a not terrible riff on poltergeist yeah but i i think honestly the only reason it exists is because they have had this beloved title sitting around and they thought they can squeeze out a few more dollars which uh which is kind of a shame that you know franchises are treated that way but then eh, you know it's a business but we don't have to I like know. it it's not terrible though but i gotta ask though uh since you love the original so much, how do you feel about the two sequels? I don't care for them nearly as much as I do the the original film. I don't uh, terribly dislike Poltergeist 2. I think there's a lot to like about that, um, at least in terms of craftsmanship and hanging out with those characters a little bit longer. I think it ends in a very cheesy, sentimental, saccharine kind of way that I don't appreciate, but the third film I've never had an appreciation for. I never saw it until a few years ago and I didn't really care for it a whole lot. I know there's a couple of things to admire about it. It's use of mirrors, for example. And it feels uh, very handcrafted, I think, in the way the two previous entries do, in a way that we don't really see uh, much of anymore, sadly. Like if Poltergeist 3 were made today, I think it would be just all cg like i don't think there would be any sleight of hand which i appreciate that about it and the fact that it's carol ann's last uh you know last story i mean heather o'rourke you know it was her last performance so there's some interesting stuff there but yeah i agree it seems like the law of diminishing returns was certainly in full effect with that series oh yeah and craig t nelson and joe beth williams apparently the, the the original cast was only signed to do that film they didn't get them to do any sequels and so both nelson and williams made a bunch of money i don't know how much but they're both on record saying they made them offers they could not refuse <laughs> um, because their careers were going pretty well at that time and they didn't have to do it yeah it's a shame they that is one thing that i absolutely hate about the third one is there is no you know part three makes me dislike the freelings a little more like if you accept it as yeah. canon it's like th- so they just got rid of carol ann i don't care what excuse the the movie is going to give me what i see in my head is these two parents who have decided they've had enough <laughs> creepy daughter and all of the hauntings right. the so they're going to send her off to the city and they're taking a vacation they're going to hit hawaii for a bit they're they're, they're just going to recharge their batteries before they have to come back and deal with more you know poltergeist shit yeah they loved her enough to go literally to hell and back but not enough to take her to Hawaii with them. <laughs> only only once. You know, the second time, I think, is where, you know, that pushed them over the bend, I think, around the bend. So, yeah. I Did you ever so. – it's a strange thing to mention, uh, and it certainly has, again, talking about trotting out a title. Uh, but did you ever watch the Poltergeist television series? No, I never did. I didn't either, so I guess that isn't going to be a long conversation either. <laughs> I was just curious if you watched it. I uh, nope. I, t- I tend to be a franchise nut. When I, I get into something, I have to seek out like, you know, every offshoot, every spinoff, every remake. You know, uh, I did it not long ago with the Howling franchise. And, uh, you know, with Poltergeist, that's one that I could never quite bring. You know, even watching the Friday the 13th movies. When, when I rewatch those, I have to check out the TV series, too, because it's Friday the 13th, right? Except it has nothing to do with that film franchise. And But right. with Poltergeist, guys, for whatever reason, I'm just like, I see literally nothing connecting. What is it called? Poltergeist, the legacy. It's like, what legacy? You're not talking about the Freelings. You're not talking about that haunting. You're not talking about Kane. You're not talking about the Beast. You're not talking about apparently anything that has any connection with the original franchise. So I think it's a hard uh, commodity to, to franchise honestly there's just not a lot there to stretch out into a longer story i don't think especially if it's centered around the freeling family i mean how many times can the same family be terrorized by ghosts before they just off themselves and drive into the ocean i don't understand why they didn't consider i mean she certainly appeared in uh the the later entries but i'm surprised that they didn't try building the franchise not around the freelings but uh around mm-hmm. tangina like you know she wouldn't have been she would have been an offbeat choice for a uh the lead of a franchise and yet she's so compelling in that first movie and the nature of her character is such that you could see her drifting through other hauntings and yeah you know, that would have been the better way to go we have the conjuring franchise right now which is uh you know every movie features a different set of protagonists and a different haunting and yet the one thing that ties them together is uh mm-hmm. uh our uh, the Warren family. So, you know, I think that might've been interesting if they'd attempted that with Tangina, but well, sadly we'll, we'll, we'll never know, but no. I'm, I'm curious to see what the next, uh, 
form this franchise takes is like if it goes to television much like you know every other big but older title does like you know hannibal and now the exorcist i think it's put to bed i don't think the franchise is going to really come back anytime soon i don't think the remake did as well as they'd hoped it would i think it's funny how the remake decide they decided to use the clown imagery to heavily market the remake and since the remake didn't do that well a bunch of clown movies that were being developed in hollywood all died including (laughs) it like they killed it for a while they're bringing it back again now but um just because of that poltergeist had a clown on the poster it didn't do well all clown movies are dead now hollywood's just so funny sometimes the way they think and the way they do things no i agree it is you know curious too uh, in a way the marketing for poltergeist it perfectly underlines everything that was kind of wrong about the approach they took in adapting that original movie. You know, when you look at the poster with that super, super unbelievably creepy clown, it looks like they, they use the James Wan filter yeah. on that clown to sell that movie. Yeah. And that's kind of the movie's approach to the haunting too. And the, the entire tale. Whereas if you look back at the original movie, the creepy thing about that clown is that it looks like any other clown. Yeah. And then it starts moving. You know, I, mm-hmm. I don't know why they felt they needed to go the extra mile or really, you know, I, I love the Texas Chainsaw remake, the one that came out in 2003. Um, and yet when I, the one thing that bugs me about it is his mask. You can tell his mask was designed to hell and back. Right. Whereas you look at the original movie and the original movie is so much more terrifying because it looks like a dead hunk of flesh that had eye holes punched out and it was draped over his face. And, uh, you know, sometimes less is more. And I think Poltergeist is kind of the perfect representation of that, comparing it to its remake. The reason it works so well compared to, you know, well, yeah, anytime they try to follow up that, that original tale. Yeah. Poltergeist comes from a more genuine, authentic environment and genuine, authentic characters. And, and the scares aren't coming out of, obviously creepy places they're coming out of a child's seemingly benign bedroom closet they're coming out of the kitchen counter they're coming out of just places you wouldn't expect i mean it just all comes out of literally nowhere and that makes it scarier Uh, i don't know today they're just a lot less i don't i don't know how to say it but they try too hard a lot of movies try too hard they phone things they telegraph things before uh, you should know that they're about to happen. Yeah, I agree. And I wonder if part of that, you know, we say they try too hard and I agree with you in a way, but I think there's kind of a laziness there too. You know, I, you look at the original movie and they take an innocuous looking item like a clown and then they make it terrifying. Whereas the remake just wants to make it scary right off the bat. They don't necessarily want to take the time to make it super creepy. And plus there's something just, I, this is, uh, a weird thing to note at this point too, but there's something just so wrong about seeing the Carolina equivalent in the remake talking to a flat screen. I understand why oh, it's yeah, the case, yeah, yeah. but it's just, it made me shudder when I saw it in theaters. I don't well, that's know. Like, like I said. That's like when they did the Fright Night remake and instead of the TV horror host, you had like the Las Vegas magician. And the, 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 the reasoning is because today who would know what a TV horror host is? It's just sad. It's not, it not only makes for a shittier movie, but it makes you feel <laughs> really, really old at the same time. <laughs> You know, I got to admit, I uh, I actually, to an extent, enjoyed the Fright Night remake, but that did make me feel old, too, because, you know, I was a kid in the 80s, but even then I, I could understand the concept of a horror host, whereas now you're right, I uh, outside of like a horror hound convention, you know, once or twice a year, I don't think horror hosts are really <laughs> very well known at all sadly yeah. but uh i understood their reasoning in the fright night remake why they made and i love david Tennant. i'm a huge doctor who nerd so uh i was completely fine with uh where peter vincent went in that movie but yeah i agree with you at the same time it it does make you feel a little bit old a little bit dated when uh when movies have to be updated like that <laughs> now yeah. i gotta ask what is your opinion being a poltergeist fan of this notion of the poltergeist curse i I mean it's a little bit interesting because i don't believe in magic or supernatural stuff really um but at the same time some films do seem to be a little bit more cursed than others i mean i really think that on on through the course of any production since movies shoot for anywhere from three to gosh nine months Someone on the crew, especially since a Hollywood crew is many hundreds of people, someone's going to get sick. Someone's going to die. Babies are going to be born. Everything that you can conceive happening in everyday life is going to happen on, on a film crew like that. But in the case of Poltergeist, 
the one of the actresses, the lead act, one of the leading crew, one of the leading cast, Dominique Dunn, that plays the oldest daughter, Dana, was murdered by her boyfriend, her her very very volatile boyfriend. Um, I think a really close to the time the film was released. It was either right before or pretty soon after the film was released in theaters. I was November, was, I think only a few months later, a few months crazy. later, he went to her house and strangled her and she went to the hospital and she was in and out of consciousness, I think. And then she passed away there. And, um, that was the biggest thing from the first film. And then on the second film, the man who plays Kane is his name Kane. The, uh, no, Yes, uh, Julian Beck. Julian Beck, yeah. He Played was already dying. Henry Kane, I think. He basically received a death sentence from his doctors before he accepted that role. So they knew he was going to die. But then also shortly after that film came out, I think uh, Samson, Will Samson, I think is the actor's name. He was also in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. He died also. And... Um, on that set, I heard that even like Craig T. Nelson was freaked out. They all found out there were real human remains on the set, and the the producers didn't really know that they were real. They just ordered human remains and assumed they would be <laughs> would be fake. Now that had to have been Hooper's fault, right? I mean, I'm going to blame. Well, the, him I don't. Him. On the first film, I've on the first film there are rumors that the skeletons in the in the swimming pool are real skeletons but i heard craig t nelson on a e true hollywood story type thing say that on the second film there were real corpses in the other side the sequel and that will sampson well let me back up t t nelson told the producers he was freaked out and and asked them to do something about it and instead they got will sampson to come in and basically do the native american native american equivalent of an exorcism <laughs> on the set and um, at least after that, nothing happened. But but I don't know. There's just weird things. The 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 crown in the whole curse thing, though, is that Carol Ann, um, Heather O'Rourke was ill even before they started shooting Poltergeist Three. They thought she had Crohn's disease, and um, they were giving her medication that gave her chipmunk cheeks, which kind of explains why she's a little puffy in the face in that movie. But it really wasn't Crohn's disease. It was some sort of bowel obstruction, and she ended up getting blood poisoning, and she died not too long after Poltergeist 3 came out. She was so, only, like, was it 11 or 12 at the time, too? I think 12. Which so, is so sad. Yeah, so four. it is curious that you're right. I mean, over the course of one movie, any number of things can happen, let alone three movies but yeah four deaths three movies and it is considered the curse i wonder if it's just because they use real skeletons like if somebody took that notion and ran with it but uh nevertheless it does persist gotta wonder. yeah you gotta wonder i don't know if i'd want real skeletons on a set of mine <laughs> especially after seeing poltergeist <laughs> is there a texas like... chainsaw curse though because didn't they use actual like real bones like I when they were, were animal out? bones though uh, i don't do think that. they were human bones maybe they were you'll never we'll never know maybe not a whole lot of bad karma that comes from animal bones like i don't guess well the curse of the texas chainsaw massacre is that no one got paid <laughs> so everyone on poltergeist was presumably paid so maybe maybe the devil works different ways on each movie <laughs> oh no doubt it could be Eesh. um yeah, it. I I appreciate your picking this movie to talk about. I could talk about Poltergeist for days and days. I uh, I I can't. Can you think of any other movie that came out at around that same time that approached the same sort of subject matter with the same sort of power that that movie has? Because when I think of the early '80s, I don't necessarily think of movies about hauntings, and yeah. it's more of something that was in the '70s. I mean, there was the haunting, of course. And then I feel like The Exorcist is sort of like that. Weirdly enough, those were our last two episodes. Um. <laughs> yeah, they were. <laughs> um, but I don't know. To, for me, the, the Poltergeist stands out because I love seeing people in peril. I remember when I saw Jaws 3, which sounds like a strange tangent, that I, I, I wanted to enjoy that movie as a kid because the, jaw, the shark was amongst people. It was in a place where panic could be uh, portrayed on screen, mass panic. For some reason, I love to see mass panic in a film, and it's very hard to pull off because you have to have a whole lot of extras for one thing, and then you need a whole bunch of people acting convincingly panicked. And um, 
and poltergeist you really get to spend time with this very panicked family and you're really pulled into it and you identify with them so closely that it's it's you're there you're in the movie with them it's happening to you and i don't think that most other films of this ilk succeed at that level i think that's really what sets poltergeist apart other than that it's just so well structured and executed i mean it flows it rolls there are there's no downtime in poltergeist there are no boring parts it is all butter and um it's just one of the most rewatchable films ever and um i don't know i'm gonna when i'm dying on my deathbed i think i'll poltergeist is one of five or ten movies i'm still gonna want to be watching uh, on a regular basis it just it's a happy comfort movie for me so it's in your own personal uh, i'm thinking of twitter right now there was that recent hashtag uh you know top seven films or favorite yeah. seven films so would poltergeist land in your top seven yes i mean i can even tell you my top seven tell, tell us please how fun would that be <laughs> i have that a would... movie review website really uh, where, can, where can we find oh, that wordpress.scottshermer.com Okay. Poltergeist is number seven. Robocop is number six. Jaws is number five. The Empire Strikes Back is number four. E.T. is number three. Texas Chainsaw is number two. And Ordinary People is number one. You will hate me for saying this. I, I, There are a handful of movies that as a film buff, I feel like I, uh, I'm committing some sort of crime for having not seen them. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm slowly making my way around to them. Uh, part of it is because my expectations are super high for certain films that I haven't seen by this point. So uh, I approach them warily. I, I want to give them the best possible shot. But uh, I sadly have not seen Ordinary People. Well, I hope you like it when you do see it. I actually didn't when I first rented it. Uh, must have been in the late 90s on video. I was bored and had to shut it off halfway through. And then a friend of mine said, you're stupid. You need to rewatch that film. <laughs> and my friend Sean was absolutely right because I watched it. And for whatever reason, I was in a different mindset. I was paying more attention or something. I love that film. It's it's the film that speaks most directly to my heart. The, the, the Timothy Hutton character in it is the most like me that I have ever, ever seen in a film ever. Like that's me in that movie. Like that's how I feel. That's how I felt at one point in time. So I just, I can't help but love it. And also just the austerity of Robert Redford's direction. I think he was brilliant in the way he handled that film. It's very well made, very effective to real drama that doesn't come off as sentimental or too exploitive, I think is a rare thing to find. But in that movie, you really see it mostly through his direction through the performances and through the lack of a conventional film score, because that's, that's one of the things that really can very easily turn your drama into a very special episode of designing women <laughs> it is, is a very cheesy film score. So instead you have the, the austerity of the Canon and D which you can read into whatever you want, but it's not a very, moving piece all by itself now i did notice all of the movies in your top seven they do come from a certain era so would you say that's your own personal sort of like golden age of film i think so because we're all i think between five and 20 the everything is set i mean i don't think we become very different people after the age of 20 um at least i certainly didn't and uh yeah, everything that happened to me during that time was was just much more powerful and uh, has left a greater impression than anything that's happened since. And I think it's because I was I was learning about who I was and I helped figure all of that out through these movies. Movies really was church for me. Movies like Pump Up the Volume and um Heathers and um Dead Poet Society um, these kinds of movies, maybe to Heather's a little less extent, literally changed my life. Literally. Like, if I hadn't seen some of these movies when I did, I wouldn't be who I am today. Thelma and Louise is another example. I mean, they're just things that, you know, they may not be the most original films ever made. Sure, there are other films that came out before them. But these are the ones that I saw when I was the right age to see and receive that story and get some meaning from it. 
So I'm not ashamed of the fact that most of my favorite films did come out when I was a child. Um, I'm sure that a, a more objective film critic would be putting things like Citizen Kane and Casablanca <laughs> there. Casablanca is much further down on my list. Um, Citizen Kane is not in my top 100 because as well made as it is, it's pretty dull. <sighs> And um, I, I, it's a little dull. It's it's a beautiful film, but it's a little dull. I will uh, my favorite <laughs> about Citizen Kane. I uh, and I always sound like it is when I make my top ten. I, I I just told a friend of mine this a couple of podcasts ago on this uh, on this show. I uh, my top four. I all consider my my number one, and then you know my list goes like number one, number one, number one, number one. Yeah number five six seven you know and i gotta say i i there's such a sort of film school snobbery feel about mentioning it but i genuinely mean it uh citizen kane is one of my number ones but being fair i will say that um it took me something like three tries to get into that film i the first two i couldn't make it past the first 25 minutes i was like my god what are people talking about i don't understand it and then at a certain age i revisited it and i was like Oh my God, this is, I, I love every second of this, not just the craft, but you know what the movie says about being, I think being a person, you know, I yeah. we get in the first 20 minutes, a very cut and dried, you know, Dickensian sort of, you know, here's a man, he was born, he grew up, this is what happened to him. Here are the facts in, you know, yeah. the case of this man's life. And then we see him through the prism of all these other people who knew him. Yes. And he was a great man, but he was also a bastard. But, you know, he was, he, he was a really good friend, except when he wasn't, you know, and I, I respond to that movie so much as a result. Uh, but I will say, yeah, it took me forever to finally get into that movie. But once I did, I, uh, I, I, I adore it. It's more of an analytical film. You don't really get to know Charles Foster Kane too much directly. You get yeah. to, to get to know him piecemeal, patchwork-like, through other people's recollections. And that, just by design, holds the audience a little bit at arm's length. Very true. So you, you can't relate with Citizen Kane the way you do, you know, for example, a Steven Spielberg movie, where you're invited to step directly into the main protagonist's skin. It's a very different kind of film. And that's why it's excellent for college fodder, because you can keep that distance and you can analyze it much more objectively. And when you do that, it's an incredibly remarkable film, if only through its uh, cinema, cinema photographic techniques. But I, I am very fond of my friend Annie, who does not like Citizen Kane, and to this day will defend her stand against the film by saying, do you know what Citizen Kane's about? I can tell you what Citizen Kane is about. It's about an asshole who dies. That's, <laughs> that's all it's about. It's boring. <laughs> she just doesn't respect it at all. But when she boiled it down to that, I was like, wow, I want you to like synopsize all the movies now, Annie, because that's pretty brilliant. <laughs> that is, there should be a book of just like little <laughs> capsule reviews as succinct as that. That is pretty great. So I tell you what, I will make you a deal. I will watch Ordinary People straight away if if you can find it in your heart to give old boy a shot. Oh, it's on my list. I just have to get to it. I need a copy of it. I'm kind of stupid in that I don't borrow things and I don't like to stream or rent things. I usually just buy them. I'm, I'm the same way. I'm still a collector. So is, if old boy comes out on DVD or Blu-ray in a very affordable format, then I'll probably just pick it up. But from what I've seen of it already, because I've seen some of the big mass like hallway fight scenes, already that's the part that i walked in on it's like what the hell is this and that's that's how it got put on my radar <laughs> that is that is what sells that movie better than anything honestly i i don't think you should even watch a trailer you shouldn't show anyone a trailer after you watch the movie and want others to see it just fast forward to the hallway fight show it to somebody and then back it up 40 minutes and be like just enjoy <laughs> <laughs> i will man i will all right, sir. I think that's just about our time for this episode. Thanks so much for joining us today. Can I uh, can I ask what we might keep an eye out for um, so far as your upcoming projects might go? Well, I just finished Plank Face with my partner, Brian Williams, at Bandit Motion Pictures. And we are – in fact, the posters arrived today. They're in my car. I haven't opened them up to look at them yet. We're having our world premiere of that in Columbus, Ohio this Saturday. Really? So, yeah, that's the first time any of the world's going to see it. Our, our cast crew screening went very well. So we're very excited to see how it's received uh, by the general public this weekend. And then we'll have DVDs, Blu-ray and some VOD options available for Plank Face this fall. So just stay up to date at banditmotionpictures.com or facebook.com 
backslash bandit motion pictures and uh, then you'll know all the latest and we're going to rush into production on another movie probably in a month or two okay because yeah. we're crazy no hey that's that's fantastic sir uh, can i ask uh, outside of a uh, bandit where uh where might your fans find you online um facebook is the best place i'm on facebook all day long um so yeah just look for scott Shermer on facebook i'm on twitter but i i i'm not a good twitter person i <laughs> I, I tweet like once a month <laughs> i am the exact opposite i can't do facebook but i am on twitter all the time mm. i don't know why that is <laughs> all right well sir thank you so much again for uh for being on and for choosing such a great movie to talk about and uh thanks to all you listeners out there as always please be sure to like subscribe share tell your friends about us and uh make certain to check out our youtube show also called scream addicts find us on facebook and twitter we are at scream addicts and i am at jinx 1981 be sure to check out the amazon links at the bottom of the page to purchase poltergeist films as well as mr Shermer's film found remember every item you purchase through our amazon link helps uh helps keep us going here so um yeah so oh and scream addicts listeners uh we have an exclusive deal for you through audible if you sign up for a 30-day free trial you get two free books so uh i guess that's pretty much it until next week gang thanks so much and have a great weekend